Good morning. Good morning. If you're visiting here this morning, we want to welcome you first and foremost to Soul Harvest Church. Thank you for coming and joining us today, whether you're family or friends or being a part of this baptism in some kind of way. Thank you guys for coming out and supporting those who are being baptized. But man, what a joy and honor it is to be in God's house this morning. Don't you feel that way in this place? Amen. It is good. Well, um, some may have wondered, are, are you going to preach? And, and most certainly, yes. If you, if you gather a group of people together, and uh, some, some may be even visiting, we want to deliver the Word of God. And, and honestly, I'm really excited about this message today. Um, I'm going to try to contain myself and, uh, in, in some kind of manner or some kind of fashion. So uh, let's pray. Let's dive right in. We're going to be in the book of Jonah today, the book of Jonah. And the message is going to be entitled, When Destination is detoured, when destination is detoured. If you're still having questions about baptism, some have sent me some emails or questions, you know, what, what's going on, what's the order of events? If you have not changed as of yet, you want to go and do that. Holly didn't announce that, mention that, but if you, if you came ready to be baptized in your clothes like I did, that's great, you're fine, you're fantastic. Uh, if you didn't bring a change of clothes, you're going to be baptized, you're just riding home wet, Dollar General is across the street. You can pick up something very cheap. And it'd be great. We will even allow you to uh, take a T-shirt from here and a towel. So make sure you use the towel for the bottom <laughs> and the shirt for the top. So, so uh, you know, just, just cover all the bases. You know, you never know. You never know. You never know. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come in your house uh, to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for your people. Thank you for salvation. In your grace and your mercy toward us, Lord, when we are certainly undeserving of it often in our life. So thank you for meeting with us today. I pray that you would anoint your servant as he speaks your word. May he speak nothing more, nothing less. Only what you would have him to speak in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Jonah chapter 1. We're going to kind of work our way through the bulk of this uh, of this story. If you haven't read Jonah, it's, great, it's a great read. I love short books in the Bible because uh, I'm kind of a list guy, so it makes me feel really accomplished when I read a book of the Bible, and uh, sometimes you just want to, you know, you want to tackle that, and you're like, I want to read the Bible, and I want to get through a whole book today, but I don't want to take a lot of time. Then read Jonah. It's a fantastic book. It's got a great message, great story, and uh, I've been un- unpacking Jonah in my personal life for years now, and just seeing some things that, that I didn't notice before, and uh, just really excited today about, about preaching this word again. So Jonah, chapter 1. Uh, verses 1 through 3. If you do have a paperback, which is my favorite, is, is, is actual Bible with paper that doesn't glow. I mean, I have one of those too, but this is great to have like a Bible that doesn't like power down. You know, it's fantastic. Uh, but it falls about like right there somewhere. It's a, little, it's a little past halfway. If you're new to reading the Bible, and that's fantastic. If you're new to reading the Bible, you get into it. Find out where you are. If you've got to get those tab thingies, get those tab thingies. Uh, for some reason, the tabs, they always mess me up. You know, like I got the tabs a couple of times in the first couple of Bibles I got, and then I realized that, that I spent more time looking at the abbreviation on the tab, and I didn't even know what the abbreviation was. So I just did the whole, the whole scan and flip thing, you know what I mean? But then when it comes to the book of Jonah, just go to the index, because you're going to be that person like me often that you're looking for, it, and it's so small. You're like, where is this? You start like saying things out loud so people don't think like you're the new Bible reader. You're like, I know where that is. It's just so crazy. I I was just reading that last night. I don't know why I can't find it today. You know, so anyway, anyway, we we get funny when we're turning to places in the Bible. We got to let everybody know beside of us. It's not our first time. All right, Jonah 1, verses 1 through 3. Then the Lord gave this message to Jonah. He said this, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I've seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Willingly and willfully ran from God. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He brought, I know it's so funny, I, you know, I went over that word like 12 times, Tarshish. That is exactly how you pronounce it. I'm just, just letting you know that because I wanted to get that clear the air because everybody's like, I think pastor just messed up his speech. No, Tarshish. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Makes you feel weird. 
So that's where he went, to Tarshish. And he bought a ticket, went on the boat, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing there. Hoping to escape from the Lord. Has your destination in life ever been detoured? You ever, you ever been going somewhere, and, and, and especially even spiritually on this journey, and you're like, I'm going somewhere. Maybe you come out of a great message you hear something that is challenging. Maybe you watched something on, online that really spoke to your heart. Maybe you read a book or maybe you read something in the Word and you're just really stirred up and you're excited like, I'm going on this journey. I'm going to this destination. And then somewhere, somehow, the destination gets detoured. Sometimes the detour happens out of other circumstances that are out of our control. There are things that happen in this life that we have nothing to do with. Amen? That we can't control it. We don't... We don't know how it happened. It's, it's frustrating because really, we, it was totally out of our control. But other times it happens, and it's because we tried to take control. I know for me, oftentimes in my life, if, if I don't make it to the destination that was intended in the first place, oftentimes it's because I have tried to take control of the situation. Now, I don't know if there's anybody like that here today. You try to run your own life and do your own thing. But I fall in that category very often in my life. Well, the book of Jonah teaches much about how God's mercy is there even in times when we take the detour. That even when we run, understand this, even when we run, even when we make mistakes, and yes, even when we sin, he is still pursuing us and driving us toward a destination. I want you to understand that about the God that we serve today because here is a man who was obviously called by God with a specific message, with a specific purpose, to do a specific thing, and he willfully and willingly said, okay, I hear you, God, what you're, what you're trying to tell me to do. I'm not going to do that and I'm actually going to go in the opposite direction, even further away from where you told me to go. Kind of brings in perspective, I think. The fact that Jonah willingly ran from God's direction. Now, I've said this in my life, and I, and I, I still think that it, it carries weight and it, and it holds some truth to it, but I am looking at this statement a little differently because Jonah willingly ran from God. Surely, if we willfully and willingly run from God, he washes his hands of us, right? I mean, I've always heard that willful sin is different than just like, you know, some people call it like accidental sin. It is funny how we just, I just accidentally sinned. You know what I mean? Like, we try to like make this distinction between like premeditated sin and then like sin where something happened and I just reacted. It, it really still sin, right? I mean, it's the same thing. You still sin, but it makes itself feel better. It's like, I didn't mean to. You know, I, I didn't think about it. Here's Jonah. He is obviously someone who follows the Lord because he hears from God. God speaks to him and he runs in the other direction. Now to me, that's sin. When you don't do what God is telling you to do, I feel that sin, disobedience is is disobedience, which is sin. So, you know, you could really say Jonah is sinning, running away from God, saying, God, I don't want anything to do with this message. And I'm not really going to get into the heart of why he felt the way he felt. Listen, Jonah, Jonah had some serious stuff going on internally. Jonah, Jonah was probably not uh, the man of God you, you thought he was. Like, he's the guy on the outside. Everybody's like, oh, it's Jonah. He's a man of God. But internally, he dealt with some serious stuff. We're not going to get into all that today. Maybe that's for another day. But I want to focus more on how he had a destination. God, God showed him a specific destination, which wouldn't you like to know sometimes a specific thing? Like God says, hey, go here, right? Or, 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 or in regards to a job or something, you don't know what to do. Like, okay, pick this one, right? Do that. Do that or don't do that. How many would like to know from, from God sometimes some things like that? Oh, oh, you want to know what to do? I'll just let you know. I'll write you a letter, and I'll just tell you exactly what to do. No, here's Jonah. He, he hears specifically from God, and yet he specifically does the opposite thing that God asked him to do. 
It's obviously God's heart for us to follow him the first time. Right? I mean, all parents, don't you want your kids to follow your, your, your instructions the first time? I mean, I do. Uh, I, and I give my kids grace. Uh, you know, sometimes, not all the time. But uh, and Ellie, she doesn't understand what I'm talking about right now, but she looked up here. She knows I'm talking about her. I'm talking about you, yes. I'm talking about you. <laughs> yeah. So... You know, we want our kids to, to do the right thing the first time. And, and I went in the room the other day, and she had this Monopoly money. It really wasn't a big deal, but we were trying to teach her, you know, the, the importance of not lying. I mean, I think it's like, it seems like a good thing to teach your kids. Like, don't lie, you know? So we come into the room, and she has this Monopoly money, and she, she had it all torn pieces, and she had that look. You don't know that look, but I'm sure you can imagine that look coming out of that little face. And she's like, It was a simple question. I don't care about the Monopoly money. No big deal, you know. We're like, did you, did you tear the Monopoly money? No. So, mm, okay. Interesting. Three seconds ago, it was whole. Now it's in half. I'm uncertain how that works, but I said, so, uh, okay, baby, I'm like, just tell me the truth. I don't care about the Monopoly money. Did you tear the Monopoly money? No. Okay, and then, you know, you start breathing a little. It's, once again, it's not that big a deal. It's just monopoly money, but it's the principle behind it. Are you, you with me? Ellie, okay, last time, like, I'm going to bust your butt. <laughs> if you don't tell me the truth, I just want the truth, you know. Did you tear the monopoly money? Yep. <laughs> Fantastic, Okay. <laughs> And, and I told her this, I said, would it not have been so much easier if you just would have said, yeah, right? And, and with God so often, I'm the same way. It's like, he wants us to do something. And he's like, okay. Like, then we say, no, no, no. He wants us to do it, no, no, no. And he's like, no, for real. You know, there's, there's gonna be consequences for this. And that's often how I am with God when he wants me to do something. I'm not so quick to say yes. But yet by his grace and by his mercy, he gives me the opportunity to do what he's asking me to do. Of course, God wants me to follow and obey him the first time. But he will allow, and hear this, he will allow, and yes, God will even cause a detour in our life to get us back to the right destination. God will allow and he will even cause a detour in our life to get us back to the right destination. You know, people struggle with that concept that, oh, would God cause this, or cause that? I, I, and I don't have the answers of what God allows, what he causes, you know, all these different things. There's a lot of tragedies and things that happen all over uh, the world. I'll say this, God, God allows things to happen. If that were not the case, then things wouldn't happen because he's in control. So he does allow things, but oftentimes it's how we respond in the midst of what God allows to happen. It makes a difference whether or not we make it back to the destination he intends. So God allows this situation to arise in Jonah's life because of his disobedience, but it is by God's grace and mercy. This is what I believe about the word of God. Even in judgment, because there's judgment in God's word, even when he speaks something of judgment toward a people group, he's trying to bring them back to him. That, listen, that's the heart of God. Please understand, when, when anything like that is spoken in the word, what God is saying is, I want you to come back to me. And I will allow, and yes, even cause sometimes things to happen to bring you back to me. I, I, I will allow this to take place in your life if it'll drive you to your knees to focus on me. Let's go to Jonah 1, verses 4 through 6. Now you're like, isn't this the story where the big fish swallows the guy and he's in there like three days? Like, yeah, this is it. So it says, The Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the sailors or the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. Everybody gets religious on the sea and waves. You know, everybody's shouting out to their God, like, come save us. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. 
And it says, so the captain went down to him, and he says, how can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. They're like, listen, man, we can eat, we get all the help we can get right now. Whoever that God is that you serve, go ahead and pray to him. We're going to pray to ours, and hopefully, like the lottery, one of us will win. <laughs> you know? So they all begin to do this. And, you know, what, what, I, what I find is that for Jonah right now, obviously, this is really not where he wants to be. Now he's like, wow, I find myself in a situation that is not good. I thought maybe I'd just run and it would be okay. But he finds out that the detour may not be where he wants to be. But the detour is always a reminder for us of the actual destination we were headed to. The detour for us is always a reminder of where the actual destination really was. You ever been on a detour, whether physically or in your life, spiritually somewhere, and, and you kind of have this moment where you realize, like, this is really not where I'm supposed to be, but now I'm going to continue to take it to get back where I need to be? You feel what I'm saying? Anybody at all ever done that? Like, I, I, I know this is not where I want to be, but if I go ahead now, if I keep following this, I, I will get back to the correct Root. When we choose a detour, it always takes us longer. That's obvious, right? I remember one time when Holly and I, we were driving to Atlanta, Georgia. We took the same road every time, you know, 75, flew down through there. And uh, I think it was like Jellico or something. Is that on 75, Jellico? There's a mountain there in Jellico. And so you go, it was a detour around Jellico. It said detour. And it was like one sign. And first of all, I start hyperventilating, you know what I mean? Because it's just one sign doesn't really say anything. Like it's going to come back or detour. And everybody's just going off. So I'm on this detour for quite a while, actually. And I was like, there's no more signs. And like throughout time, like people are taking different roads and going off. And then all of a sudden I find myself, I'm the only one. And I haven't seen a sign. There's been no lights. There's been no yellow flashing things. I'm like, baby, I think we're lost. So I knew we were kind of driving in a similar direction that we were before. So I was like, let's just keep going. Okay, so I just kept going. There was no one to ask anything to, no place to stop. I just kept going. Long story short or longer, have you want to look at it? It, it was a three-hour detour that I took. I, it took me three extra hours to get to Atlanta and we just enjoyed it, you know. It was like, let's just take our time. We're going to get there at some point in time. Three hours later than what we usually, it usually takes us to get there, we made it. And uh, somehow I eventually ended up back on the correct road because I have sweet navigational skills. And, um, and we made it. It was, it was a good time. We had some Waffle House afterwards to calm me down. It was great. But here, here's what a detour is. A detour is a long or roundabout route taken to avoid something or to visit something along the way. In, in, in Jonah's case, he was taking a detour to avoid what God had asked him to do in the first place. He was taking a detour. When we take a detour away from God, all we are doing is we are avoiding our purpose, which can only be found in him. Listen, there are people right now in this world, all of them taking detours to avoid God in their life, to avoid having to face God, face themselves, face their sin, deal with the issues internally that, that lives within them. There are people on detours all over, and they're not ever going to find the purpose of God in their life if they don't first surrender to the giver of the right destination. They will search, they will try to fill themselves with everything, everything they think will fill a void, they'll, they'll try it, they'll do it to see, can I find purpose in this? Can I find pur purpose in this person? And then that person is out of your life, you're like, wow, I thought they were my purpose, you know? And then they're gone, you realize uh, maybe that wasn't it. Listen, without a relationship with God, you cannot find true purpose in this life. And ultimately, you can't find the right destination. Listen, even in our detour, God's mercy does not cease. How many believe that? Even in our detour, God's mercy, it doesn't cease. The book of Lamentations, I love this scripture. Chapter 3, verses 22 through 23, and it's going to roll right on to verse 31 through 33. It says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. 
His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Man, I say that you, you don't know how many times I say that scripture a week. Lord, your, your, your mercies begin afresh for me this morning. I'm grateful for that. For no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Very important, verse 32. Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of his greatness, the greatness of his unfailing love. For he does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. Know that, please. No matter what you're going through, God does not enjoy causing sorrow. He doesn't. Know this about a detour in your life, if you happen to be on right, one right now. A detour is not wasted time if you learn from where you've been. I know that I will never again take that turn on Jellico. Won't do it. Never is a pretty serious word, but I'm, I'm trying not to do that. A detour can teach us a lot about where we've been, about where we're going, about what we shouldn't do again. So if you're on a detour right now away from God's direction and, and destination from your life, I want to encourage you with this. It's not wasted time as long as you learn from where you are. Learn from where you are. See, a lot of times people take a detour and they'll just act like they never did it. That's the worst thing you can do because you're, you're just showing that you didn't learn from it. You're showing you didn't learn anything from it. You didn't gain any perspective from it. You didn't realize where you were wrong. And listen, we do ourselves a disservice when we are unwilling to say that we're wrong, that we took a wrong turn. The book of Jonah helps me to understand God's relentless pursuit of humanity. Please hear this. The book of Jonah helps me to understand God's relentless pursuit of humanity. Can't you see his pursuit even now in the world in which we live in? His pursuit of humanity. When we are wrecked, when we are wretched, when we are sinners, amen. God has a relentless pursuit of humanity. His pursuit of Jonah in Jonah's stubbornness and his pursuit of Nineveh in their sin and rebellion shows me God's mercy. Jonah had a serious attitude problem. If you read on, you find out Jonah, Jonah didn't even want the people of Nineveh to be saved. He said the real reason why he didn't want to go to Nineveh is because he knew that God was merciful and he knew if he went and, and delivered this message of judgment that they might turn from their sin and he didn't want that to happen. He wanted them to be destroyed. He's not so awesome now, right? But how often have we been the same exact way when we see people and view people and we don't want good for them because they maybe done something to us or wronged us in some kind of way and we don't want it to work out for them. We see someone, they start coming to church and it's like, oh wow, really them? I, I, they, I know, oh, mm-hmm. And how many times we, just like Jonah, find ourselves running from God with an attitude problem, but God is relentlessly pursuing us. I find some encouragement in that. I wanna encourage someone else to let you know that a detour can serve a purpose. A detour can serve a purpose. Just to tell you a little bit before we get to verses 15 and 16, these guys, the sailors, they have, this, they have this conversation. They start saying, pray to your God, you know. Um, this is someone's fault. So then they, they basically, they, they draw, draw straws, if you will, to find out whose issue it is. And, and Jonah, you know, he's the guy. It's like, and then, then they all stare at him and they're like, what did you do to offend your God? You with me? These are the most spiritual sailors I've ever seen in my entire life. What did you do to offend your God? And then he tells them, he's like, I'm running from God. He told me to go somewhere and I'm going the opposite direction. They're like, man, what is wrong with you? They're like, what, what God do you serve? Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm Hebrew, I serve uh, Yahweh. He said, oh my gosh, we're in for it, man. <laughs> I know that guy. I've heard about some stuff. <laughs> we're in trouble. So 
jo- Jonah comes up with this, with this idea. He says, listen, throw me overboard. That's not maybe the first thing I would have said. <laughs> He's like, you know, this, this, this will, you know, this will cause the sea to, to calm down. Just throw me overboard. Obviously, something was telling him internally this is what was supposed to happen. Or, I mean, or I, I wouldn't have said something like that. And uh, they're like, no. They keep rowing harder and faster. The storm gets worse and worse. And then finally, you know, after they throw everything overboard, they, the sailors, listen, did everything they could possibly do to, sh- to save Jonah's life. You know, they did everything they could. And finally, they're like, listen, man, may your God not hold this against us, but you got to go. <laughs> That's kind of how, how they went with it. Like, may God not hold this against us. We'll see you. And, and the Bible says the storm, the sea calmed. As soon as Jonah <laughs> was thrown overboard, I mean, imagine being on that boat, man. You, you just repented just then. And guess what? That's what happened. All the sailors, starting in verse 15, it says, The sailors picked Jonah up, threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice, and they vowed to serve him. Every sailor on that boat said, God, we serve this God. We serve the one true living God who is able and who is worthy, who can do these great and miraculous things. We serve him. Isn't that amazing? That even in our detour, God is rescuing men from their ways of destruction. Even in your detour, God can not only rescue you, but rescue people from their ways of destruction. Let's go to verse 17, two through two. You know, Jonah's story doesn't stop there. It goes on. The, The storm was not necessarily calm for him. It says, now the Lord had arranged a great fish to swallow Jonah And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. And he said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. We we need to learn from Jonah and allow our desperation of the detour to drive us closer to God. In desperation, you shouldn't get further from God. You should get closer to God. But here's the thing. It's your choice. When you are far from God, when you're on a detour, it is your choice. Do you want to continue on this pathway? And and for some, it's a pathway of destruction. Or do you want to surrender to God and, and and allow that desperation to drive you to the right destination in your life? Listen, for some people, desperation is about the only thing that causes them to get to God. For some... Hopefully for all of you, that, that's not the case, and, and, and God doesn't have to allow things to happen in your life to drive you to him. But I'm telling you right now, God will allow it. God will allow it, not because he doesn't like you, not because he doesn't care for you, not because he wants bad things to happen to you. How do I know that's not the God we serve? Because it says he doesn't enjoy those kind of things, but he'll allow it. He'll allow it to get you to a place of desperation to where all you can see is you, you gotta look up. Some people... They, they have those crazy stories for a reason because they're the kind of person that they, they, they can't see God unless there's nothing else to see. Now, I know that's a hard thing to probably swallow for some of you, but God loves you enough to not allow you to continue on a detour where you won't end up at the right destination. God loves you so much that he moves heaven and earth to get you back to where you need to be. But we have to choose him. We have to choose him. Detours can restore your purpose and perspective if you let it. Only if you let it. Let's go to Jonah 2, verses 10 through uh, chapter 3, actually verse 2. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I've given you. Did I read verse one? Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. A second time, that stands out to me. 
Because I believe God gives us second chances to do the same thing. God gives us second chances to do the same thing. Aren't you gra- grateful for that? <laughs> Have you ever just bombed it? Maybe you haven't. I don't know. I have. I've bombed it before. I've been like, God, if you give me another chance. And I've bombed that one too. <laughs> right? So, that, so that's, that's why I, I think it even speaks of not just a, just a second chance, but second chances. I, and I can speak of that from my personal life, of him continually, relentlessly dealing with me about things that maybe at, at the time I wasn't ready or, or willing, let's say willing to, to let go of, but yet in his relentless pursuit of me, I realize, okay, God, I see you want to do something through this. You want to do something in me through this situation in my life. So I'm grateful that God gives us second chances. I want to say, too, that this statement about second chances, this is not to minimize our disobedience. I I, I by no means want to minimize disobedience or minimize sin and not address sin for what it is. It is not to minimize disobedience, but to magnify the heart of God toward humanity. I think, this is my opinion, I think that that's what we should be doing as pastors, as leaders, as evangelists, as missionaries, as, as ministers of the gospel, and as Christians. We should be magnifying the message of God's heart toward humanity. Do, do I believe in sin? Absolutely. Do I believe sin separates you from God? Absolutely. But continually talking about the sin that separates us from God does not give us a solution to bring us back to God. So it is, it is my, my personal stance that I believe when we deliver messages, we need to focus on the heart of God toward humanity. Yes, Jonah sinned. Yes, Jonah ran from God. I don't know where Jonah would have been if he wouldn't have turned, but I can say, say this. In his desperation, he did turn because of God's relentless pursuit of Jonah's heart. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross can overshadow any sin that we commit. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross can overshadow any sin that we commit. What I mean by that is that it covers it. His sacrifice on the cross covers us of our sins when we put our trust in what he's done for us. So for close, I kind of want to go down through here. I, I just so happen to believe that you can see Jesus in every book of the Bible. Uh, I actually, in, in Bible college, it was one of the hardest but best projects I ever had to do. It was called the Jesus Project, I think, or the Life of Jesus or something like that. Um, so we had to find Jesus in every book of the Bible. So it was 66 pages. A was the scripture B was the context of the scripture, and C was how we see Jesus in that scripture 66 times because there's 66 books in the Bible. And I was like, there is no way that I'm doing this. No way I'm passing this. But then I realized, like, wow, Jesus is actually in every single book of the Bible. It's amazing. Even before he was even on the scene. Is it a type, is a shadow of Jesus in the Old Testament, even. So I want to I take you through this. Let's read Jonah. Chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. And then I want to talk about Jesus in Jonah. It says, The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne. He took off his royal robes and he dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. That's what the king said, the king of Nineveh. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat and drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? That's what the king says. Listen to what he, what he says about God. Perhaps even yet God will change his mind 
and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and he did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Maybe you didn't know that God has actually changed his mind about something. So God, God doesn't change his mind. Well, the, the Bible actually, it doesn't matter what translation you have. You can go back to King James if, that, if that's your thing. Look at it. God changed his mind. God changed his mind because the people will turn to him. You see, because that's God's heart. That's God's heart. That's God's heart toward humanity. But I want to talk about Jesus for a second. Jesus in the book of Jonah. Jesus is threaded throughout the fabric of Scripture from beginning to end. It's simply a matter of noticing the pattern. Now, I might lose some of the gentlemen on this, but it's okay. I, I think maybe some of you guys will connect with this, but I like these jeans uh, a lot, and I, I like them for many different reasons. I like Levi's jeans, particularly. They fit nice, you know what I mean? It's just like something about Levi's jeans, they just fit nice. And I got these other ones that are blue, and they, they got like a, uh, like a brown thread through the, the stitching, you know, in the pockets, you can see the brown. Anybody? Nope. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Wow. You're like, man, you were talking about Jesus, and you start talking about threads, and it was over. You just lost everybody. Stick with me. We're going somewhere. But I like that thread because that thread sticks out. Most people probably don't even notice. If you just kind of look at jeans real quick, you don't even notice it. Now, every time I wear those jeans, specifically, you'd be like, wow, okay, I see the thread he's talking about. It's just like the brown thread all the way down. Very subtle, very subtle things. But Jesus is the same way in the scriptures. As you look throughout all of the scriptures, you just glance at it. It's like, oh, okay, it's a scripture. But then if you really look at it and you view the detail, you see the thread of Jesus through, through everything. It's the very fine detail of Jesus Christ, and he, he sticks out above the rest. On these like gray pants, it's like a dark gray thread that if you look close, it's there. You can see it. But you gotta look close. And you gotta focus on those things and think, when you're reading the word of God, how, how am I seeing Jesus in this? And when I was reading this text, I, I was praying, God, how can I see you in this? How can I see Christ in this? And how is redemp redemption speaking through the scripture? Because listen, I believe redemption is a key factor in all of the message throughout God's word, redemption. Redemption and reconciliation, which is once again, bringing people back to him. That's the thread, the common thread. It's the thread that sticks out in all of the scriptures. Jonah was in the whale beneath the sea for three days, just as Jesus was in the grave. Jonah was sacrificed for the men when he was thrown overboard into the sea, just as Jesus sacrificed himself so men could be saved from their sins. Jonah was released from the whale as Jesus was resurrected from the grave on the third day. Because Jonah delivered the message, the people repented and received God's mercy. And because Jesus, living God's message and conquering death for them, people have an opportunity to know grace and mercy because of what he's done. The debate is not, did a fish actually swallow Jonah? Did that actually happen? People get all caught up on those things and they, they miss the point. You're missing the point. God is trying to tell his people through these stories that I'm trying to get you back to me. I'm trying to tell you some dramatic thing to show you how much I love you. Whether you believe these things to be absolute fact if, or, or if it's just a story, regardless, know that it's God's heart toward you to draw you back to him, to say, listen, you, you're on a detour now, but let me bring you back and show you what destination looks like. Let me show you what purpose looks like. Let me show you what reconciliation looks like and restoration. It's God's heart toward his people that through every story, every scripture, in the Bible, he's saying, listen, just come back to me. Come to me. I have everything you need. God's not after you. God's not trying to punish you. God loves you and wants you close to himself. That's what he wants for every single person, I believe, 
in this whole entire world. Yes, this whole entire world. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, to me, that indicates anyone. There's no stipulation on that. Anyone, any background, any tribe, tongue, tongue, nation, doesn't matter where you're from. Anyone who believes on Jesus Christ will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the heart of God toward his people. You may have experienced detour in your life. You may have experienced difficulty. And for even some who are being baptized today, maybe you're, you're kind of on the fence, like, man, is this, is this for me? Listen, have you said yes to Jesus? It's for you. And I want every person here to know that about baptism. Do not think that it is set aside for, for those who are spiritually elite or those who are all of a sudden ready to be baptized. If you said yes to Jesus, then you're ready for baptism. Because what it is, it's an indication of what God has done in your life. What I believe about baptism is that it does not save us but it is an outward expression of something that has taken place internally. An outward expression of something that's taken place internally. The Bible says, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. So those who are taking that step today, they're not counting in this water to save them, to redeem them. They've already counted in Jesus for that. This water is simply an indication of what God has done and what he is doing in their life. Amen? So if you're here today, even you came, you're like, I, you know, I've been contemplating about it. If you're born again, take the step. Take the step. If you're born again, take the step. You may have experienced detour. You may have experienced difficulty. But there is destination. And it begins and it ends with Jesus. Jesus is what it's all about. From the front to the back, the beginning and end, Jesus Christ is what it's all about. Before we do this today, before I ask people to come up and kind of stand before we, uh, before we do baptism, I wanna give every person here an opportunity. If you don't know Christ, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do so. You can just leave the lights on. You stay right where you are. But I want you to have an encounter, a moment with God right now in this place if you don't know him. I wanna give you this opportunity. If everyone could just close your eyes for a moment. If you're here today, you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, but you, you want to. You realize that he loves you. You realize he, he cares for you. You realize that he gave his life for you and that you need him. You need, it. You need forgiveness of your sins. I wanna pray right now and I wanna invite you to pray with me. I wanna encourage you and urge you. Invite Christ into your life. He will cleanse you of all your sin. The Bible says he will make you a new creation, new. Old things have passed away and all things are made new. So today, if that's you, I want you to pray with me. I invite Christ in your heart. Church, would you help me pray? Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I need you. Cleanse me of my sin. I put my trust in you. Come into my life and change me. Help me. Lead God and direct me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. According to God's word, what, what sets you apart is your following. That is your response to God. What, what, what will cause the world to view you as a Christian, as a believer, is how you live your life according to what the word says. So, so I wanna let you know, you know, sometimes we say, let's raise our hand if you prayed that prayer today, and that's a great moment. I love those moments. But today I wanna, I wanna kinda spin this thing a little differently, and, and I wanna tell each person that if you prayed that prayer, you prayed that prayer, first of all, know that you're born again. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved, Romans 10. You're born again, but here's the thing. When you go out from this place, continue to follow Jesus. Continue to read the word of God, continue to pray. Get in a local church if you're not in a local church. I don't care if it's this place, as long as they're preaching the message of Jesus Christ, you need to be there. Get around the body of Christ. Let them encourage you. Let them strengthen you. 
and follow Jesus. The first disciples, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I'm telling you right now, you follow him, he's gonna make you something. Follow him and people will begin to see the evident change in your life. Amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand.